What's up, storytellers? I'm C.R. Rowanson, the Magic Engineer, and it's time to talk about magic. In this video, we're going to be digging into the magic of the Mistborn trilogy and looking at how you can build a similar magic system of your own. More specifically, we're going to be using the Magic System Blueprint to analyze the core attributes of primarily Allomancy so that you can see how it fits into the setting and into the world and how you can imitate that in your own story. Most of this video is going to focus on Allomancy, but I am planning on taking a really quick look at both Hemalurgy and Ferrochemy at the end of the video. There's not a ton different in the settings between the three, but we are going to look at that, so just bear with me. In my intros, I think it's important that I take a minute to discuss what the videos are not about as much as I explain what they are about. This video is not about the underlying patterns or the almost iconic power matrix that you see in all of the metallic arts found in the Mistborn trilogy. If you want to know more about that structure and how you can use it and ways that you can imitate it and amplify and use it, you should check out my other video, which is called How to Structure Your Magic System Like Allomancy, which you can find right over here. Fair warning, there are some minor spoilers in this video, so if you haven't already read the series, what are you doing here? Go get cracking. Now, let's get into it. While the seed crystal is an important piece of the magic system blueprint, whenever I'm analyzing somebody else's magic system, I try not to presume what inspired them and where the ideas came from, so we're just going to leave that blank. The first area that we're actually going to focus on is the perspective. Because any time you're analyzing or building any kind of magic system, it's important that you stop and understand what angle you are examining the magic system from. In our case, we really only have one option because I'm not Sanderson. I'm not best buds with Sanderson. And as much as I would like to have all those insider secrets, I, I don't have any for you. What we do have is our experience as the readers. That's the perspective we're going to take on is the perspective of the audience. The audience perspective really is our best option here. So not only can we use it to draw on our experience while reading the books, but if you're building your own system and trying to imitate some of the stuff in Mistborn, I recommend you take this same perspective so that you can craft your magic system based on what you want your readers to experience. First up are the types of magic, and it should be no surprise that all of the magic in Mistborn is a hard rational magic system. Hard rational magic systems are a huge part of Sanderson's draw and honestly his voice. At the very beginning of the book, the metallic arts are painted as a very mysterious and ephemeral and unknowable force, but that changes quickly as we go through the book. In fact, in a single chapter, we go from knowing very little about the magic system, specifically Allomancy, to knowing probably around 80% of the entire magic system, which is why this is just a great example of a hard magic system. And while we know most of what the magic can do, there are definitely nuances and applications that aren't immediately clear based on what we've seen. Granted, once we know a piece of information, we can use it and think about it and extrapolate and apply it in different ways. In fact, if you read through those first couple chapters where Vin first learns about her magic and stop and spend some time, you can actually come up with all of the applications and all of the clever uses that you see throughout the rest of the series. Because that's how this magic system works. Once you know this piece, you can rationally apply it in all these other places. Hence, a rational magic system. If you want to know more details about what makes a hard rational magic system, or you want to learn about the other types of magic systems, I highly recommend that you go check out my other video, The Four Universal Types of Magic Systems. Next up is transference, and the transference of Allomancy and the other metallic arts is pretty standard for a traditional magic system. It's way low on the spectrum because you're either born with it or you're not, with the exception of hemallergy, which is its whole other thing. But for Allomancy, you either have it or you don't. And even if you have it, it's not guaranteed that it's going to be awakened. You have to go through some pretty grueling stuff for the powers to actually manifest. And once you have the power, there's no moving it about. There's no gifting it to another person. There's no transferring it from here to here. Okay, okay, there is one exception, 
But, you know, that's Elend. He was dying. And as far as we know, that was the last time that that could happen in those circumstances. So I'm still going to say that this is low transference. Next up is prevalence, which I put around medium, medium low, because while we see a lot of Alamancers and Mistings and Mistborn, we know that the number we see is not actually representative of the entire population of the world. Alamancers are actually pretty rare. In fact, that becomes a major part of why the noble houses behave the way they do, and a lot of the underlying structure of their society ties into the fact that they aren't that common. On top of that, the concentration that we see in Luthadel, the capital where most of the story takes place, is much, much higher than it is anywhere else in the world. So all of that combined, you're looking mid, mid to low in the spectrum. Oh, and if you're listening to this, you have no idea what the hell, I'm probably not allowed to say that, am I? What the heck I'm talking about? Surprise, surprise, I have another video that you can check out. So if you want to know what the Magic System Blueprint is and what these pieces are, you can check that out over here in the sidebar. Next we have Source, and I have the Magical Source for Alamancy pegged as an external and renewable source. We're going to start with renewable because that is by far the ob most obvious of the two. To use their powers, an Alamancer must consume metals and then burn them to produce the magical effects. That means they have a finite reserve of power to draw on. Once the metals are burned up, they're done. They can't produce any more magical effect until they find and consume more metal. So that is what makes it renewable. It's a finite source that once depleted can be refilled. If it was a truly finite source, then once it was gone, it would just be gone. On the setting level, it may or may not be renewable, and we just don't know. There may be a finite amount of metal in the setting, and once that's all been consumed by Alamancers, boom, no more magic. But we don't know that. There might actually be some magical means of recreating and refilling the metal reserves of the world. It's certainly true for some of the metals, but we don't know if it's true for all of the metals. The internal-external portion is definitely up for debate. I still think it's external, and let me tell you why. Because the power is in the metal. Granted, you have to have the ability to burn the metal. But without the metal, there is no magic. Therefore, it, there is an external thing that these magic users need to go collect, harness, and use in order to produce their magic. So they may have the ability to use it, but the actual source, as far as they're concerned, is external from their body, which means they can be separated from it. It can be removed, it can be hidden, and it can be taken away. Again, there's some arguments for internal, but I find it more useful to think of this in terms of an external and renewable magic source. Next, Flux. This one is interesting. At first blush, it might seem negative. I mean, they're consuming the metals and they're being destroyed, right? And if the metal is the source of the magic, then that is a decrease in the total magic of the world, therefore negative. Well, kinda. The thing is, we're not just concerned with the metals. We're concerned with the magic as a whole, which does include the genetic portion of the system. And as we go through the series, we learn that the power of Alamancy, in fact, comes from an even greater well of power, which can't actually be created or destroyed. It can just be adapted and changed, which is why overall the magic of Alamancy is more of a neutral flux than anything else. Again, all of this goes out the window if you're Elend or if you're using Hemallergy, but we got to draw a line somewhere, right? If you're enjoying this video, please do like and subscribe. And I'm also told that that little bell is kind of important. I don't know. You do you, as long as you doing you is liking and subscribing. Next up is naturalness, which sits right around the middle of the spectrum. It has some stuff pushing it one way, and it has some stuff pushing it the other way. The things pushing it down on the spectrum to lower naturalness are the fact that it's only used by humans. We don't see Alamancy really anywhere else in the world. There aren't any monsters using it. There's not any natural phenomenon that are duplicating those effects, except the mist, which a Again, is a big spoiler and really ties into the origin of Alamancy, so I'm going to stand by my statement. What pushes the system further up the scale of naturalness is how closely it's tied to the natural laws and phenomenon of the world. When you have the push and pull metals, those 
connect heavily with physics. When you have the things that amplify physical attributes, those, they're taken to an extreme, but they are just extensions of what we kind of already naturally have. And that connection to the world and reality around it, combined with how it's only existing in some specific places, brings it right about to the middle. Now, ease of use. For Allomancy, the ease of use is actually medium low. And before you get upset, two words for you. Skill cap. Or is skill cap one word? Hyphenated? Whatever. I don't know. You get my point. Assuming they have the ability and they have metals in their system, Allomancers can use the magic instinctively on the level that they might not even know that they're using it. In fact, that's kind of a big plot point in the beginning of the first book, when Vin is doing stuff and doesn't know she's doing it, and it almost gets her into a lot of trouble. Yeah. What brings this down in the spectrum is just how important skill is. A skilled Allomancer will always beat an instinctive Allomancer of the same type, or even of a different type. That's a huge part of the story. That's why Kelsier is able to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Steel Inquisitors, which are arguably much, much more powerful than he is. But his, his skill with pushing and pulling of metals allows him to hold his own against an opponent that should be able to squash him. And that is why overall the ease of use is actually, I think, medium low. Now, reliability and consistency. Those are two separate variables, but they're both the exact same setting for the exact same reasons. They're both high. They are pretty much topped out because when somebody burns metals, it will produce an effect. That is never in question. The magic doesn't flag. The magic doesn't fail. The only time it doesn't work is if it is being actively countered or interfered with by other types of magic. And again, that's nothing on the actual reliability of the magic itself. If you burn pewter, you're going to get the pewter effect. You burn steel, you're going to get the steel effect. As for consistency, it doesn't get much higher than this. It doesn't matter who you are, the magic performs the same. The strength may vary a bit from person to person, and skill definitely varies from person to person, but the actual mechanics of the magic and how all of these other variables sit and function for that specific person are all the same always. That's the magic system blueprint for Allomancy specifically. So how do you use this? Well, when you're building your system, keep these settings in mind. You don't need to do a duplicate of Allomancy, but making sure that you're keeping your consistency high your prevalence in the same area, making sure that you're keeping it in the hard rational quadrant. Keep those settings the same and then change everything else about your system and you will now have a magic system that can fit into your story, into your world in a similar fashion as how Allomancy is applied in Mistborn. Again, I can't stress this enough, this doesn't mean it's a duplicate. It can be a wildly different system, but by mirroring these settings, you can apply it and use it in the same ways as a storyteller. All right, now we're going to take a quick look at ferrochemy and hemallergy. I promised, didn't I? The first difference for ferrochemy is that prevalence is much lower. It's about as low as it can get. The terracemen, who are the hereditary owners of the ferrochemy birthright, they haven't really been hunted to extinction but it's pretty close. There are even breeding programs in place to try and minimize the number of people born with ferrochemical abilities, which flows nicely into flux. Depends on how you want to look at it, but it seems pretty negative. It seems like every day the amount of ferrochemy is probably decreasing in the world. There are rebel factions that are actively working to renew and maintain the ferrochemical bloodlines and ferrochemical abilities. But in the stories, we don't know how successful they actually are. And over the course of the trilogy, we meet two, well, three ferrochemists, two of which die. That's negative flux. Hemallergy has three settings that are a little different. The primary one is transference. That's the entire point of hemallergy is that you can use it to steal power from one magic user and imbue it into another. 
that's what it does. Ah, transference. Then there's flux, which is actually positive, at least for most of the story. If you really look from the beginning to the end, it's negative. But for most of the story, it's positive. The amount of hemorrhage that is being used in the world is just ramping up as we go towards the climax of the overall series. You have more Steel Inquisitors being made, more Coloss being made, and more just agents of ruin being created by um, forcing hemorrhage onto specific people, shall we say? Oh, it's so gross, and I love it so much. But yes, flux is positive. Then there's the naturalness, which shifts lower on the spectrum. This may seem a little odd because it's based on blood, and blood is extremely natural and fits well in the order of the world. But the applications and the visuals and how it seems to work is bizarre and disturbing, and the Steel Inquisitors are supposed to survive and do things when they really, really shouldn't. All of that drives it a bit lower on the naturalness spectrum. At the end of the day, this is all subjective. You may disagree with some of these settings, and that's fine. What is important that you know where you think they should sit. So when you go to build your mirrored magic system, you know how to put your settings for your system. That's the really important part here. If you've watched the other video, or even if you haven't, and you want to know more about the magic system blueprint, I wrote an entire book on what the tool is, how to use it, and how to adapt it, how to change little facets of your magic system to get it exactly where you want. Unsurprisingly, the book is called The Magic System Blueprint. You can buy it now on Amazon. I highly recommend you check it out, and not just because it's my book. I think it's, I think it's pretty awesome. Not only does the book go into more detail about all of these components that we've discussed, there's also a number of examples that I use throughout the book so you can get a better grasp of what they mean and how they can be applied. Allomancy is one of them. I also look at the magic from the Lord of the Rings, from the Marvel Cinematic Universe, and from Stargate. Because I love Stargate! And that's all I have for this video. Please, again, consider liking and subscribing to my channel. And if you want to hear from me personally on a weekly basis, consider signing up for my newsletter. I will leave a link in the description below. So please check it out. Whether you do or don't, whatever you do, keep writing and stay awesome.